postdoctoral del Centro de Investigaciones sobre las Familias de la Universidad de Cambridge. Eh, ella tiene, estudia en una línea de investigación sobre familia, relaciones y bienestar psicológico en familias no tradicionales. Su tesis doctoral la realizó sobre el tema de las familias por donación de óvulos eh, y eh, actualmente está realizando investigaciones sobre familias de padres gays que han recurrido al procedimiento de subrogación. Tiene diversos artículos y publicaciones sobre el tema que para aquellas personas interesadas en profundizar en su trabajo están eh, las referencias disponibles en la página web del Centro de Investigaciones sobre la Familia de la Universidad de Cambridge. No me entretengo más en su presentación, tiene mucho que contar sobre el tema eh, que nos está ocupando y sin más le paso la palabra para que no perdamos mucho tiempo y, y sea ella la que está acá. Uh, hola, uh, lo siento, no habla español, so uh, I will stick with the English. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to be here today. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. And I really look forward to some interesting discussion and learning more about the situation here in Spain with non-traditional families. So, I'm here from the Centre for Family Research in Cambridge, and here is a photo of us all at a very lovely conference in a hot, sunny country that is not the UK. And in the centre is uh, the director of our research centre. Um, this is Susan Galanga. Uh, it's a pleasure to work with her, and she has been studying these families for over 30 years. So I'm interested in all different kinds of families and how parents and children are doing. So I'm currently working with gay fathers who have used a surrogate to have a baby, as well as single men who have used a surrogate to have a child and start a family on their own. I'm also very interested in children's understandings and feelings about their families. So today I will very quickly run through what we mean when we say non-traditional families and why and how we study them and then I'm going to present some data from some studies at the centre on how they're doing and I'm also hopefully, if I have time, uh, presenting some data from children in the families. Is everything okay with the translation? Should I speak faster or slower? Or... It's okay. Um, so just to... Okay. <laughs> so there is a excellent book written by Susan Golombok, which is all about the kind of families I'll be talking about today. So I recommend that highly um, if you are interested in this area. And what do we mean by non-traditional? It's very common in the social sciences to compare new families to old families. And by old families, we think of families where heterosexual couples are married. It is the man who goes out to work and the woman who stays at home. Parents have had their children naturally, they're genetically related to them. And we also have the primacy of the nuclear family. So grandparents and aunts and uncles are less visible, and it is this nuclear family, four or five typically, that are important. There's also an assumption that parents and children are of the same ethnicity, the same heritage, and they all live in the same geographical location. Michael Lamb has written a lot about how this actually is not how families were. It's more of an image of 1950s American families, because um, actually in the UK and elsewhere, it was more common historically for many generations to live together in the one room. So it is a powerful image, but it is perhaps inaccurate. 
So now I'm going to talk about new families. And these are families where um, they're very different in structure. So often parents aren't married. They might be living together. Um, they might not be able to get married because of the legal conditions in their country. They're often not heterosexual. It's not the case that there is a general divide of labour between men and women, but more of a dual earner household where both parents, if there are two parents, will be earning money. And with assisted reproduction technologies, the assumption that children and parents are genetically related is also one, where if women have used egg donation, uh, they can give birth to children to whom they are not genetically related. It's also the case that parents and children might not have the same ethnicity. So for um, gay couples and single men who have used a surrogate who's had to have a child, this is an age of the global family. A French man and a Spanish man might have used a surrogate in India and it might have been cheaper to have an egg donor flown in from the Ukraine. And for their second child, they might then decide to go to Mexico to find a surrogate mother and perhaps have an egg donor who is from Mexico because it is cheaper. So we have a case where siblings aren't related to each other genetically and parents and children aren't genetically related to each other. And this is becoming increasingly common. So with assisted reproduction, um, in the UK there are 10,000 children born every year through assisted reproduction. And actually many of us who many people who use assisted reproduction come to Spain as you are a centre of excellence for egg donation and have a lot of <coughs> egg donors that we don't have in the UK. Uh, we are now at a time where children can have five or more parents. Children might have a genetic mother, a genetic father, a surrogate who carried the baby, a social mother and a social father, or perhaps two social mothers or two social fathers. And other routes to parenthood include adoption and fostering, which are slightly less new, but still under the umbrella of non-traditional. I'm going to talk a bit about why these families are interesting to study. From evolutionary psychology, which is a very big, very popular field, there is an understanding that parents will only invest in the warm, committed parents to children to whom they are genetically related. So the motivation for parenting is to carry on their genes. There's also a strong idea in philosophy that it is essential that children know who their genetic mother and father are for the development of a coherent identity. So the, so the assumption from, from these fields is that parents and children who lack a genetic relationship will have less warm relationships and that children are going to be very confused about who they are. There are also concerns that parents who have experienced infertility are going to be less good parents. So they might have struggled with infertility for many years, which might be very detrimental to psychological well-being. And the relationship between couples might also be badly affected by this experience of infertility. There are also concerns about secrecy or openness. So where parents have used a donated egg or a donated sperm, 
and the couple's heterosexual, they might not have told their children about their use of a donor. And there have been worries that keeping this a secret is going to have a very bad effect on family relationships. So there will be a divide between those who know the secret and those who don't know the secret. There's also a general feeling from adoption work that children benefit when they know their origins. It's a very difficult time we are living in to keep a secret. <laughs> so we now, in the streets of New York, I recently came across the DNA truck, which has the slogan, Who's Your Daddy? where you can go into the truck and very quickly have your results of paternity and genetic relatedness. So this is a, a growing reality that if there are any doubts or you're unsure, you can also um, go onto a website like 23andMe and take a swab of your cheek and send that off to the internet and have your results very quickly about your genetic relationships. So time has moved on and families, some families are struggling with this, uh, keeping a secret in these kind of conditions. There are also lots of concerns about families without mothers or families without fathers. So a strong feeling that men and women contribute different kinds of things to parenthood. So in terms of children's gender identity and gender role behavior, there's a feeling that women, uh, that girls learn how to be women through their mothers and they will learn how to be men through their fathers. So in families where there is an absence, are children going to be confused about their gender? And this ties into a general argument that families headed by gay or lesbian couples in particular are inherently unnatural. And this is a very difficult concern to address with research. I'm also going to be talking about single parents. So we live in a time where more people than ever before are single and have the option of starting a family on their own. So there's concerns that single people who become parents are faulty, so something is wrong that they cannot sustain a relationship. There's concerns that single parents are selfish. And with um, same-sex parents, there's concerns that children will feel really different. There'll be no one that looks like they do. And that for this reason, children might be more likely to be bullied. So I'm going to talk a bit about research methods, which I find very interesting, so forgive me if you don't, but I will briefly describe the approach that we take. So at the Susan Golombok at the Centre for Family Research conducts longitudinal studies. So um, we see families over time. We also like to use lots of different methods. So in-depth interviews with parents and with children, uh, standardised questionnaires, Increasingly important is observation, and that's taking videos of parents and children playing together in some way, and then coding them as a group to a standardized manual. Interestingly, it's with observation that we find some of our most interesting findings. And we also do a lot of work with the children themselves who are often forgotten about in family research. 
So we like to go into parents' homes and speak to mothers and fathers and children and to get information from children's teachers about how they do in school. So it is a very expensive and time-consuming approach to research. And we try to look at lots of different aspects of family functioning. <coughs> so we study parents' psychological well-being. So do, what kind of uh, level of depression or anxiety or stress do parents feel? We study the quality of couple relationships. So there is an idea that if couples are particularly happy in their relationship, this positivity will spill over into the parent-child relationship. And likewise, if there's a lot of negativity in the couple's relationship, it will spill over into the parent-child relationship. We study the quality of the parent-child relationship. And this is very difficult to do, uh, but we look at things like levels of warmth, between parents and children, levels of conflict, uh, the nature of discipline, and we also look at parents' levels of social support. So do they have a good friendship or family network that they can have help from? And finally, we're, we're mostly interested in children's development. So um, is there any psychopathology? How are children doing in school? And my personal research interest is how they think and feel about their families. So we try and take a very global approach and study as many different things as possible. So forgive me if that um, was repetitive, but um, I'm just going to move on now to some research about outcomes and how we find families are doing. So one study we have done at the Centre for Family Research is looked at single mother families, and these are women who have used sperm donation to have a child. So this is a study of 35 families in which children were between four and eight years old. And we recruited them through a fertility clinic in the UK. So we try and be systematic and invite as many people as possible to take part. But obviously, for those who don't take part, we don't know anything about them. But the people who do take part often have um, struggles and difficulties. So we like to think that we don't only hear from the happy families. So we found that most mothers in these families have been in long-term relationships. And the main reason that they've used sperm donation is because when they wanted to become a mother, they felt their partner wasn't suitable, and it wasn't the right person to have a family with. And we've, in terms of psychological well-being, mothers have been found to have relatively normal or low levels of depression and stress and anxiety. And they have high levels of social support, so they report that there are lots of people in their life that they can turn to for help with their family. So quite a positive story from the mother's point of view. We found that most mothers have told their children about the fact that they used a sperm donor. And the usual story is that a nice, kind man at the hospital helped them to have a baby. It's also the case that 30% of mothers haven't told their children. So we don't know what they think about who their father is or how their family came to be. Um, this we have not we haven't yet analysed the data from the children. It's ongoing right now. 
Previous studies have found children have no psychological problems. It be very similar to children growing up in other kinds of families. And we're just analysing our data to see if we've also found this. I'm going to quickly move on to a second study. And this is families headed by heterosexual couples who had a child through sperm donation, egg donation, and surrogacy. And we also have a control group of children where children were conceived naturally. Children in the UK from 2005 onwards will know the identity of their donor. But the children in this study will, were born before 2005 in the millennium, so they will never, it's very unlikely they'll be able to find out who their donor was. Um, at all, we've gone back uh, over 14 years to see these families. I've been working on the project for eight years, and at every level, we found um, parents to be psychologically well adjusted, and for there to be high levels of marital equality. And when children were very young, age one, two, and three, we found that parent-child relationships were actually more warm and more loving in the assisted reproduction families than the natural conception families. And this is perhaps unsurprising because parents have really struggled to become parents, often for many, many years. So they're very committed, very loving parents. The story is not quite the same when children are age seven. That, uh, there's similar levels of warmth um, in natural conception and assisted reproduction families. They look more similar. <coughs> and what we've been interested in is uh, secrecy or disclosure. <coughs> so when children are age seven, we found that most parents have not told their children about the use of a donor egg or sperm. So um, the percentages shown on the slide is the percentage of parents who have told. So it's quite low for donor insemination, sperm donation, and much higher for surrogacy. Surrogacy is slightly easier to explain to children. Um, you can use terms like, um, mummy had a broken tummy. Whereas for egg and sperm donation, it often involves the use of saying the word sperm or egg, slightly more complex when children are young. It's, it's a challenging task for parents to tell their children about their conception. The gay couples, they had higher levels of psychological well-being compared to the other parents. And we also found parent-child relationships were more positive in the gay father families. So why would this be? It could be because this is so new, and there are so few gay couples in the UK choosing adoption, it's those, those couples that are really committed and at the forefront of change that are going through this process. And it might be that social workers working with the families would only let the very best couples go through the process of adoption. We found that no children in the study had reported being teased about having gay or lesbian parents. But how this will be as children get older, we don't know. It might be more likely to happen in adolescence. So, so the children in this study in all three groups were found to be well adjusted. Mm -hmm. 
So our conclusion so far is that the kids are alright. Uh, most of the studies have looked at families where children are young, under the age of 10. So it's difficult to, to conclude how families with older children are doing, and that's work that we need to do. But in terms of parents' well-being and relationship quality and children's well-being, we find very few differences between different family structures. And in fact, we often find that the non-traditional families are in many ways doing better. So the question is, what can we learn from non-traditional families? Uh, so if I still have time, um, I can talk a bit about how children think and feel about their families. This is very difficult with research to do, because children, when they're younger, might not understand what we're asking them. It's difficult to concentrate for long periods of time. They might feel, um, you know, who is this stranger asking me all these difficult questions. <clears throat> and we take the ethical aspects of this work very seriously. So if children feel uncomfortable in any way, we don't ask, or we change the subject, or we play a game. So it's most important to us that children are comfortable and at ease with our research. We also only talk to children when they are aware of everything about their families, so they know that there was a sperm donor or an egg donor. So some of the questions we have tried asking are, um, your mum told me that a man helped them to make you. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? And do you remember how you felt when you were first told about that? <laughs> so some examples from children. So at the age of 10, a boy in a sperm donor family said, I'm fine, I don't feel any differently, I'm just carrying on with my life, I don't really think about it much, because there's so much more like special things on my mind, cooler things, so I don't really care about it much. And another said, I feel fine. I don't, I don't feel bad or cross in any way, it's just pretty much nature, so I can't do anything about it, I wouldn't like to do anything about it. And here are some quotes from children with a lesbian mother. So, I would like to know who my dad is. I would just like to meet him and maybe have a conversation with him. I mean, I probably could become a secret detective, but I'm not going to do, go to those kinds of lengths because he doesn't want to be contacted. So I wouldn't. Just like it's always something, it would be interesting. And another child says, sometimes I used to wish that I knew my dad, but I don't really anymore. It's not like an important thing in my life for now. I have two parents, I don't feel the need to find a third. My father. I used to wonder what he was like, whether I was like him. And here are some quotes from mothers, single mothers, who have been telling their children about how they were born. So one mother says, He's not interested. He thinks that the figures are hilarious. There are these little strict men and girls and boys and babies, and he quite likes those ones. So he's talking there about a children's book, used to explain how the family was born. 
And another mum said, I was explaining that, you know, that we know the sperm donor is a very kind man and his comeback was, how do you know? You've never met him, which I thought was very sensible. And he also said, if he was so kind and nice, why can't you just marry him? <laughs> So, um, well, hopefully today I've covered exactly what we mean when we say non-traditional. A little bit about our research approach to the families. And I appreciate it was very quick, but um, also some data of ours which says they're doing fine. And then a few quotes from children, which I think give us more of an idea of the experiences of these families. And so I, I will leave it there, if that's okay. Tiempo a todas las intervenciones y más rápido. Empezamos con la primera persona que quiera pedir la palabra para. ¿Quién quiere hacer alguna pregunta? Pues lo intento. Muchas gracias, profesora Madrid, por su exposición que ha sido muy rica en metodología y en ejemplo, eh, ya que han sido muy variados, pero nos ha permitido ver los avances en distintos campos que además están relacionados con otros estudios que han sido presentados estos días, así que se enriquece de ellos muy interesante. Yo, yo quería hacerle una pequeña eh, aportación respecto a los estudios que está haciendo eh, con los niños directamente, eh, mencionar que la profesora Garrido y yo hemos hecho un estudio del que ya hablaré un poquito esta tarde, en el que hay un, 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 una técnica cualitativa con niños, eh, y creo que te puede resultar interesante, el, ya lo hablamos esta tarde, el, el ver cómo nos acercamos a los niños, porque decir un poco de lo que me ha parecido entenderle y que me gustaría que se extendiera en, 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 en cómo realizaba esa entrevista con los niños, si es una entrevista eh, con juegos, pero con, con preguntas necesarias o con preguntas que surgían a partir de los juegos. O, en fin, si podía dar más detalles de, de cómo hizo en, en estos encuentros con niños. Yes, I think um, that is the most fun part of the work, but the most difficult as well. 